Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the SNEA Networking Storage Forum webcast. Everything you want to know about storage, but we're too proud to ask. This is the 10th webcast in this series. Today is part TOPE, the memory pod. And we'll be talking about uh, memory and how it relates to storage, how it differs from storage. So let's go ahead and get started with this webcast. Again, this is the 10th in a series of uh, for everything you want to know about storage, but we're too proud to ask. Today's presenters, we are very excited to have Alan Bumgarner from Intel and Alex McDonald from NetApp. I am your host, John Kim, chair of the SNEA NSF, or Networking Storage Forum, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. A few brief words and two slides about SNEA. So SNEA at a glance, we're over 170 industry-leading organizations, 3,500 active contributing members, and over 50,000 uh, total end users, professionals, consultants, vendors, and so forth worldwide focused on storage and storage networking. You can learn more about SNEA at SNEA.org and SNEA.org slash technical. You can also follow us on Twitter at SNEA. The legalese and disclaimer here. So this material is copyrighted by SNEA unless otherwise noted. Member companies and individual members of SNEA may use this material uh, under the conditions listed here on this slide. This presentation is a project of SNEA or the SNEA. And neither the author nor any of the presenters are attorneys and nothing to be or should be construed as legal advice or opinion of legal counsel. If you need legal advice or legal opinion, please consult your attorney. All right, so uh, other, also no warranties imply express or express content. Use it at your own risk. So that's our standard disclaimer. But now let's get started. Today we're going to talk about memory, but from a storage context. You know, how is it similar to storage? How is it different from storage? Alex will give a background of memory, a brief history, as well as talk about how they have traditionally been different, both in how they work and how they're treated. And Alex will also provide a sense of scale a scale in terms of capacity and performance or latency. We'll then talk about persistent memory, and Alan's going to talk about how you can program persistent memory, also known as non-volatile memory, and some of the persistent memory solutions that are available today and how you can use them and how they're supported in different operating systems as well as applications. So let's go ahead and get started. Alex, I think it's now uh, time for you. Good afternoon, John, or good morning, I think, where you are. I love these international presentations where we're all over the world doing this. So um, welcome to Scotland for this part, because I want to talk a little at the end about something that's peculiarly Scottish. The first thing I want to talk about today is, is memory. And, and the way we talk about memory and storage is different. And I think we do so because of some of the technologies that have been developed over the years. And I want to discuss a little about these technologies. But the thing to recognize in terms of a modern dictionary definition of memory from a computing perspective is that it forgets stuff. Uh, we tend to treat memory as dynamic. Memory is the place where we buffer data. Data lives on storage. You know, storage is a persistent bit. We move it to memory, we operate it on memory, and we clear it from memory back to storage again. And this idea that we have two different types of stuff for dealing with data, I think is quite interesting. And it's partly due to the history of both memory and storage. So I want to take a little uh, diversion through the history. So I suppose our first memories would be things like punch cards and punch tape, but I'm going to ignore those and go for more up-to-date pieces and talk about mechanical memories were really the first type of memories very small amounts of it, and they were based on relays. And then we had the williams Kilburn tube in around about the 1940s. Uh, in fact, I've seen this particular invention on the top right hand. It's basically a, like a big oscilloscope, puts dots on a phosphor screen, which are read off, and it's sort of, sort of persistent. You have to keep refreshing the dots every so often to be able to get some persistence in your memory. But it's actually at the um, Mountain View uh, Museum of Computing Science, which if anybody's ever out in Mountain View, I would st strongly recommend paying a visit. It's quite a, quite a remarkable place. 
uh, um, very good from a historical perspective. Uh, interesting to note that we've got very little history in that sense, what, 60, 70 years of computing, but even so, it's a wonderful place. So the williams Kilburn tube was the first attempt, which was spots on phosphor. Then we got delay line memory, and delay line memory was pretty interesting in that it used acoustics, in other words, the sound down a bath of mercury or a tube of mercury and bounce sound off the other end, and you could actually get the number of bits in there by encoding basically pulses through this mercury delay line tube. Uh, it's not a very well-known fact, actually, but Alan Turing, who uh, worked at Bletchley Park during the war, code-breaking uh, on the um, Enigma um, uh, the set of encoders that the Germans used during the war, they, they, he suggested using neat gin as it exactly the same acoustic properties. It has a lot of other uh, more desirable properties of mercury. One, it's drinkable. And two, as John, um, John Kim reminded me earlier today, drink too much of it and it will blank any memories you've ever had. Uh, the, the Scottish element in this is that uh, Scotland actually exports huge amounts of gin. I think, in fact, we might export more gin these days than we do whiskey. But certainly, I think uh, delay line memory became quite popular. But a lot of these began to disappear when we lo started looking a bit more persistently at memory and started looking at storage. And storage is quite different stuff. Storage is actually quite persistent. And sometime around about the 1930s, drum memory, which is just, if you think about it, it's like, a bit like a disc, except instead of a spinning platter with heads running across the top of the platter, a drum is basically a drum with heads running down the outsides of that uh, cylinder. Uh, drum memory was quite popular for quite a long time. In fact, I, I remember, um, I guess I am that old, I remember replacing drum memory with a, a disc memory uh, way, way back in the, uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you exactly when, because that gives my age away. But certainly what was incredibly popular shortly after that was magnetic core memory of ferrite rings, or its equivalent when mi militarized, which was thin film memory, but it used a similar technique. It used magnetic fields, and it was actually persistent, but it was slightly different from storage in, in one respect that I'll come to in a minute when we start talking about the way that we access these things. And then we've got disks, and the Winchester has been an amazing technology for a, a huge number of years. So we've, we've got a range of technologies with different characteristics, um, and now, we've got something that we want to talk about a little further today called persistent memory, which is a bit of an oxymoron, I know. You know, memory should be persistent, but because of history, our memories have not been very persistent, our storage has. And it's a different way of looking at it, I suspect. But persistent memory is quite interesting from that respect. So, memory or storage. So the key attribute for me is not that memory is not persistent, storage is, but in fact it's addressability. Now, what do we actually mean by addressability? I'll come to that in a second, but basically it's the difference between being able to address a byte, a very small unit, or a block, a very large unit. And in memories we tend to address bytes, and in storage technologies we tend to address by block. I'll cover that in a second. What has been absolutely true is that a lot of the ways we've looked at these technologies has been driven by the available technologies, and they have a variety of costs, sizes, speed, and persistence, and that makes the way we deal with them quite different. Programs, that the applications that we run on top of our computing, deal with loads of stores for fine grain. So in other words, I fetch variables into registers from memory, I do things with them and I store them back out to memory, so load store type operations. Or alternatively, blocks of data for bulk, where I take an entire 4K, for instance, and move it from a slow device to a much faster device, process it at the byte level, and then send it back as a block to that slow storage layer again. And in fact, that's one of the things that's really important about the way we think about this. There's a guy out there called Terry Matheson, uh, very famous on news groups, a great assembler programmer, really good all-round guy, sits on a lot of language committees, um, designing languages. 
who said quite famously, and I think this is actually the SIG on his emails, almost all programming can be viewed as an exercise in caching. And that's really what about managing these different types of memory and storage technologies is about. It's an exercise in caching. But I'll come back to that in a second. Somebody's just thanked me, by the way, for pointing out that Scotland exports more gin than whiskey and uh, thinks that Sydney is a great place for this kind of information. You're welcome. So what we need now is to get a sense of scale because we've got all these different memory and storage technologies, and I'll cover some of them in a minute, the, the modern ones, rather than the old-fashioned things like delay like. But basically it boils down to size, speed, and cost. And we've got this classic thing of pick any two from three. Now, I'm going to need Alan's help here because Alan gave me an analogy earlier, but what I've shown you here is you can either have it cheap and capacious, but then it won't be terribly fast. Or you can have it fast and cheap, but then you're only going to be able to afford a very small amount. Alan, you used to sell hi-fi systems, didn't you? And, and what, what, was, what was your claim? You get any two for three? What was it? Is he there, Alan? No, nope, I'm not going to get him. But I think Alan. I think Alan. Alan nope, sorry, here we are. Uh, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, you know, back in my younger days, uh, I did a lot of hi-fi work, and uh, one of the things we used to tell customers was you can have uh, cheap, any two of the three, cheap, loud, or clean, uh, but you can't have all three. So you can do cheap and uh, loud, but it won't be clean. Uh, you can do loud and clean, uh, but it won't be cheap. <laughs> or you can do uh, cheap and clean, but it's going to be really quiet, not very loud. <laughs> Exactly, and we've got the same thing. In fact, there are quite a lot of triangles like this, triangles of, of quality, um, you know, quality speed, etc. And I think that's, that's you know, this classic pick two from three applies in spades when it comes to memory storage technologies. If it, if it is really cheap and it is very capacious, then we all know it's pretty slow. And correspondingly, if you want it really fast and really big, by goodness, it's going to be quite expensive. So we've got a sense of scale in terms of being able to pick two from three. But the other scale that we need to think about is the latency. How long does it take to do operations on these particular kinds of memory and storage devices? And I'm showing here all the way out on the left-hand side for memory operations, which tend to be volatile, as I indicated earlier, even though it's, you know, this is volatile memory and DRAM that we're talking about. And it, it goes from as low as one, in fact, sub one nanosecond, uh, all the way out to tape on the right-hand side, a big block bulk operation that might take 40 million nanoseconds. And that's you know, a huge number of orders of scale. And the important thing to remember here is a nanosecond is how far light travels in uh, a foot. So uh, Grace Hopper, God bless her, invented the COBOL, used to hand out pieces of wire approximately a foot long to represent a nanosecond. And I, I, I've actually got one of these things. And it's a, it's a, when you think about it, it's not a big distance, a nanosecond. It's a really small distance. But then, what does 40 million nanoseconds look like? That's really a, a, a significantly different thing. So if we, if we think about a memory operation as like getting an apple from the fridge, if you store apples in fridges, I'm not quite sure if that's the best place for them. But let's go get an apple from the fridge. And we can do that in, you know, pretty quickly, the blink of an eye. And that's like one nanosecond. That's like a, an L1 cache. Uh, chips have various levels of cache on them of various sizes. The L1 cache is right next to the CPU and is the smallest, and the, the fastest. And then if we went out and we look at the level two cache chip, it's like three nanoseconds. So you've got a noticeable flicker. You can actually you know, see that flicker. Um, 10 to 20 nanoseconds, time to say A, all the way out to a network packet, moving a network packet from Europe to the USA, which takes 45 milliseconds, which is like work waiting for a seven-day delivery. These are the orders of magnitude that we're talking about in terms of latency in human terms. Excuse me a second. I'm afraid my throat is a little <coughs> dry today. So in terms of the storage operations, 
Getting a box of apples shipped and delivered could take you quite a long time, whereas getting one from the fridge is really quick. And that's true of memory as well, memory and storage. And we have these layers with their different latencies and their different capacities, and they are significantly different. I can't, the one thing that struck me over the years is how accustomed we get to drawing you know, straight lines for things like response time when in fact we're dealing with uh, natural logarithms or orders of 10 and how different a nanosecond is from a second. It's, it's just, it's a huge difference. And those kind of differences are really important when it comes to managing memory. Uh, incredibly important. So at the top, we've got a few thousands of bytes at most right next to the CPU with the registers and the level one cache. And at the bottom, we've got a magnetic or even optical devices that can provide us with huge quantities of data at the petabyte level or even higher. And at each level, there's a factor roughly, don't take my word for this, this is, this is just a rule of thumb, and like all rules of thumb, your thumb may not be the same size as my thumb. There's about a factor of a thousand different between each layer, both in terms of the cost per bit or byte, and also in terms of its latency. So we've got a fairly good flow in terms of where we should think about data being when we process it. But we've always had a bit missing in the middle. If you look at that diagram, you'll see that the bits in gray, we've had magnetic, and now we've got NAND flash, where we do things like SSDs. And then we've got DRAM, dynamic RAM. And then we've got the cache and the registers. But there's been this gap between NAND flash and DRAM. And the gap between the two has been approximately around about a factor of 10 to the 6. So there's a new technology coming along, persistent memory, that fills that gap in terms of its latency. It's much faster than NAND flash, but it's slower than DRAM. And because we could pick any two from three, if you think about the capacity, the cost, and the, uh, perf uh, and the performance, this kind of performance profile gets you a certain amount of bulk, not as much bulk as you get for SSDs, and it gets you a certain amount of performance, but not as much as you get for DRAM, for a cost that sits between the two in terms of the cost per bit. So that again, in sense of scale, these scales are really significant. And I can't emphasize how different doing something in a level one cache, you know, way down to the three to less than the nanosecond level, all the way up to dealing with a block on disk and taking two and a half milliseconds to actually access it. These are real big differences. So there's this new memory paradigm, like memory, quite addressable. But like storage, persistent. So it's unusual in that respect, because if you look at what's above the orange, it's all byte addressable. And if you look at what's below the orange, it's all block addressable. And this bit in the middle gives us something that is quite unique because unlike the bit above that's byte addressable and not persistent, and the bit below that's block addressable and persistent, this is byte addressable and persistent. And this gives us a unique set of challenges and opportunities in being able to utilize this new memory technology. And I want to come back to Terry Matheson's comment about all oh, programming can be viewed as an exercise in caching. If you think about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis of computing, using data, you're moving it from tiers from the slow, cheap, and capacious to the fast, small, and expensive and volatile, and processing it. And this persistent memory can provide you with a binding between the two types of uh, memory and storage that we've, had, we've, we've got currently. So that binding gives us a new way of thinking about persistence, fast and persistent. And it also gives us a new way of thinking about memory, slightly slower, but much more capacious. And that's a really interesting way of, <coughs> excuse me, that's a really interesting way of utilizing this new tech technology. Uh, somebody has just picked me up on my pronunciation of DRAM rather than DRAM. Um, and that's possibly due to my Scottish heritage. We're more accustomed to drums than we are anything else. So persistent memory, a type of non-volatile memory, is disk-like. 
in that it provides you with this persistent layer, but it's memory-like in that I can address it by the byte, and I don't need to do any I.O. or direct memory access. I can just literally treat it like memory and have it persist. And that's a, that's a novel concept. And that novelty has caused us at SNEER to go away and think really hard about how do we use this new technology that fits in between existing memory and storage technologies that we currently have. So at this point, I'm going to hand back to John, uh, who will take us uh, and, and introduce Alan and take us through the next part of the presentation. Alex, thank you. So I had two observations. One is that uh, DRAM is not, can also be a measure of weight or a measure of liquor. So maybe you were thinking of a DRAM of scotch or a DRAM of gin uh, to enhance your uh, waveline memory. Uh, when you were saying that and talking about uh, DRAM. And the second is that, so it's interesting you said that, uh, let me just step back for a slide, that before the advent of persistent memory, that it looked like everything above the line was in the faster, you know, on this hierarchy, the faster media was all byte addressable uh, with load store commands, and everything below the line is block addressable is, is with I.O. commands. Is that right, Alex? Effectively, the, the bit above the line is byte addressable, and you can think of it as being actually addressable pretty directly from the CPU. I don't need to do anything fancy. I just go out there and load it or store it. I'm doing operations on the memory bus. Anything below the orange line, I'm having to do I.O. I'm having to go out and talk to a different kind of interface, not the memory bus, but an I.O. interface, and I talk to that I.O. interface, and I give it instructions about retrieving data from a device that, you know, the CPU has pretty, not a great deal of understanding about. It's, it's independent of the CPU. That device will then pass back blocks of data that it puts into memory, and at that point, the CPU can process it. So that's really, there's a, there's a key difference here. That, that line, this persistent memory line, is completely new. We've, we've We've only had this really with ferrite memory, but it really wasn't a big issue because we didn't have very much of that stuff and we, we didn't even think about it in the same way. But this is a new paradigm for us, this idea that we can have something that's addressable by the CPU. We can actually go out in the memory bus and talk to it, but hangs around. You know, the big red reset button doesn't work anymore. When we power things off, we power them back on again. Everything we wrote is still there. And that's quite different from the way that we traditionally thought about memory. Okay, and I would, Alex, I would you. actually add uh, to, you know, if you want to elaborate between byte and block addressable, a really easy way to think about it is the uh, example that Alex gave of the apples. Uh, when I when I have a CPU cache line, a CPU cache line is generally a 64-byte uh, cache line, and that's what it can hold. So when an application tells uh, the memory controller, give me, 64 bytes of data and actually sometimes less than that, um, that's what it will retrieve from memory. Um, when an application can't find that in memory, it has to go out to storage in which it has to invoke the actual storage application. Storage is an application, um, which causes a context switch in the CPU, um, which means you're, you're spinning up an application, you're loading another cache line to open the storage application, you're telling the storage application, go get me four kilobytes, which is 64, 64 byte cache lines, uh, go get me four kilobytes of data and ship it in, and then I'll take the 64 bytes that I need from that. Uh, so it, it kind of references directly to the give me one apple or, or you know, pick up my phone, order a box of apples and have them delivered, if that makes sense. Got it, Alan. I think that's very useful because as you noted, there was a question from the audience about please elaborate on block versus byte addressable. So I think that's very useful. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll move forward uh, with Alan's section, but I would just remind the audience, if you do have any questions, please uh, keep them coming. You can ask your questions online and we will answer as many of them as we can. Any questions that we cannot answer live, we will answer in an FAQ that's published uh, ideally about a week after the webcast. But having said that, let's now go forward and Alan's going to talk more about persistent memory and how you can program it uh, as well as different use cases. So with that said, Alan, let me turn it back over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, hey, everybody. Alan Bumgarner from uh, Intel. Uh, I have the, the privilege of working with uh, the non-volatile memory programming technical work group in SNEA. Um, 
that's the team that works uh, across the industry to uh, develop the programming model um, and a few other documents that we're currently working on, which I'll uh, allude to in a little bit. Um, but published, um, I think, in 2015 first and then updated again in 2017 is the, uh, the SNEA non-volatile memory uh, programming model. Um, and this is kind of a high-level uh, abstract version of how persistent memory should work inside of a, a actual system. Um, it talks about exposing the new block and the file features to the applications. Um, and the way to think about this is when your 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 application, um, and we'll talk about it in the next few slides, has a couple of options to use persistent memory. One, you can use it like storage, um, or you have a storage application that directly addresses it. Um, you can map a um, kind of like mapping a file in storage, you can map a, a block of persistent memory like a file for your application through the operating system. So it's kind of a halfway uh, thing. And then there's a, another version of it where you can actually full-fledged uh, directly access memory, flush, uh, do fencing, etc., from your application directly to the persistent memory. Um, the, the programming model itself talks about all of those things um, including atomicity. Uh, atomicity, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, really is just a, something that's unbreakable. Uh, so when you think of an atomic uh, transaction, it's a, a transaction that can't be taken out of order. I think the, the easiest way it was explained to me was uh, pi can't really be broken. It's uh, pi is 3.14, um, et cetera, et cetera, but it's a, a kind of a, an unbreakable uh, atomic thing. Um, use uh, the memory map files, um, and it, it kind of gives uh, some examples of how you want to do that and, and what the ideas are behind using these memory map files for persistent memory. Um, and then there's a, uh, the programming model goes as far as to discuss the attributes and some of the use cases of persistent memory, um, but it's not an API. So this is really just a document that kind of gives you a really good abstract overview. Um, across a number of different uh, architectures um, and keeps it kind of high level. You can move on to the next one. Okay, so see we have a question. Uh, what exactly persistent memory is? Does it store data inside DRAM? or will it use flash to store data? Um, the persistent memory uh, that's out there in the market, um, and maybe I can give you a really good uh, difference between what DRAM is and what flash is, so, or, or, or um, the one that I'm familiar with, which is the one that Intel makes, which is 3D Crosspoint. Uh, it's kind of similar to flash. In DRAM, it's really an electrical field that's applied to a lot of gates, and the, the bits are flipped inside of that electrical field uh, so when you lose power, the electricity goes away, the electrical field goes away, and you you kind of lose your data. Um, flash is a little different. It uses a, a a mechanical or kind of a crystalline structure. Um, it's maybe a different way to say it, where you apply voltage and flip the bits. So when you lose the voltage, that structure is still there. So it's actually a, a physical structure down at the uh, cell level. And what happens with persistent memory, um, is when you're addressing uh, bytes, so you're loading from your CPU caches into that persistent memory, and once you put that data in there, if the electrical field in DRAM goes away, you've lost that data. Um, if you're putting it into persistent memory, if the electrical field goes away in your system, or the electrical not field, but the electricity goes away, the physical structure is still there with the bits. So upon reboot, um, if you have the right operating system and everything set up uh, correctly to use it, the data should all still be there. Um, and, and I think we've talked a little bit about what isn't persistent memory. And persistent memory can speak in block. So you could write an application that will package things up, you know, 64-byte 64, 64 cache lines into a 4K block and, and send it off to your persistent memory. Um, but you can also do that 64 bytes at a time. Uh, so you can go much, much smaller accesses to your persistent memory. So you can make it look like a disk or an SSD, uh, but it can also be um, the same as memory. 
All right. Let's see, a couple questions. Yeah, good question. Uh, if persistent memory is fast and can appear as byte addressable memory, why bother with uh, persistent memory needing to be block addressed? Um, and the next few slides actually, that's a good good prelude into the next few slides. So there's a few different ways to do um, access to persistent memory. And um, going all of the way to modifying your application, which is kind of the furthest uh, journey you can go where you're doing fencing and flushing and uh, all of those things inside of your application versus you can just map a little bit uh, with a, a less modified cache, less modified application and a modified operating system to make it look like storage. Uh, so there's a number of uh, APIs that the programming model uh, talks about. One of them is the storage, one of them is the file, and one of them is the memory. And I think the, the easy way to think about this is when you make it look like storage, it's, it's really little application modification that you're going to do. You just really need your operating system to understand that. And even in the file uh, point, it's when you uh, map a file to your application, the file maps through the memory controller directly to the persistent memory aware file system, which touches the persistent memory. Um, and I think my next slide talks a little more about that. So you can use your persistent memory like an SSD um, and not have to modify your application too much. Um, the next version is where you use your persistent memory like an SSD with no page cast, or you do what's called direct access. So now your operating system needs to support uh, that piece of uh, um, the persistent memory programming model. And then kind of the third one is really when you oops, uh, use the far right uh, line, which is when you've directly mapped memory to your application, um, and your application is aware that the, the memory is persistent and is using the proper commands. Um, like you would use on normal uh, memory, including the persistent flush commands. Okay, when you're using uh, your persistent memory, and, and I think I'm going to answer a couple of these questions that are coming in in the next few slides. Um, as a fast SSD, the, the storage APIs kind of work as expected uh, from the operating system and memory mapping the files can page them into DRAM. Um, when you use it as a direct access, uh, your storage APIs still work the same, and now you're not paging into DRAM, you're mapping directly to the persistent memory itself, uh, so you're not uh, paging at all. Um, and then when you're using persistent memory, and there's a third mode uh, we're using, and it's just volatile capacity, um, and that's where uh, you are potentially using DRAM as your cache and you just have one big, huge uh, thing of main memory. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, most of the persistent memory uh, that's available today is a much larger capacity than the actual DRAM that's available. Um, yeah, let me, let me address a couple of these questions really quick. So the, the performance and latency as like an SSD versus PCIe, NVM SSD, and with DAX. Again, it's going to depend on the level of access that you're doing. If you're doing, um, and one thing that storage is very efficient on, and, and uh, my partner Alex can probably give you a much uh, more in-depth answer, um, is storage when you're doing sequential 4K block transfers, um, and even larger than 4K block transfers, is extremely efficient for uh, longer haul or over the wire uh, types of transactions. So I can move a whole lot of data really, really quickly once it's packaged up. Um, when I'm doing that directly to a, a smaller persistent memory device, um, I can still get really, really good performance, uh, but the best use of that device is for smaller than 4K block uh, uses. Uh, the latency, uh, the latency is really the big difference. Um, so the second question, uh, the the latency will be more like a memory access. Uh, so DRAM accesses are in the nanoseconds, uh, whereas most of the time your SSD accesses go into the microseconds. Um, and we tried to elaborate on that with the scale previously. Um, DAX uh, being a memory access uh, would look a, a little lower latency than a storage access. Um, 
jumping back over to the slides really quick, uh, you know, I kind of try to give a couple of examples of NVDIM uh, applications where you can do things like, um, and these aren't specific to NVDIM N, sorry, that's kind of a typo. These are just NVDIM applications um, or non-volatile or persistent memory applications. Um, if you're doing an in-memory database, uh, there's things like journaling um, where you do, uh, you kind of keep track of the transaction so you know what's uh, been committed to the database and what's still pending commit. Um, and that helps you, you know, reduce your recovery time in case of a, a power outage. Um, and you're keeping that journal in a persistent space. When you move that journal from a, a storage device to a persistent memory device, you can actually reduce the latency and potentially even some of the things that you need to journal. Um, in that example, and we've seen a lot of people um, modifying their in-memory databases uh, in this instance. Um, for a traditional database, you know, you have logs, which also keep some of the uh, uh, transactions. And uh, depending on how many of those logs you're keeping, um, you can combine the writing and the caching pieces for that logging, um, and that'll reduce the, the latency of commit to a database for a transaction. Um, for enterprise storage, and this kind of referenced is what uh, Alex was talking about a little earlier, when when you're programming, programming is really an exercise in tiering um, or caching or cache tiering if you want to add them all together. Um, but when you're doing this, you're, you're pulling your hottest data up to your DRAM and to your cache. Uh, you've got hot data or medium to hot data that you can keep now in your persistent memory, which won't operate obviously as fast as DRAM. Um, but can have a much larger capacity. And you can really start to play around with the things that you want to do with your write buffering and your metadata um, and where you want to put those because if you do lose power and it's in persistent memory, uh, it will exist when the power comes back at uh, rather than uh, constantly flushing those things from DRAM out to storage. Um, virtualization, uh, one of the examples that we've seen from uh, a lot of people in the industry is you can have a higher VM consolidation just because of the greater memory density. Um, a lot of VMs uh, require a certain amount of memory density, uh, but don't particularly use them. So over-provisioning is also an option there. And then for high-performance computing, um, I'm not the expert here, but uh, checkpoint acceleration and or elimination. When you're doing high-performance computing and you're, um, you know, a really good example is uh, some of the folks at CERN um, or even some of the folks in Lawrence Livermore like to uh, do, you know, what happens when I blow something up um, inside of a supercomputer. Uh, and they, once you blow something up inside of a supercomputer program, um, you have all of this data that comes out instantly from the calculations that you're doing on uh, the different molecular, molecular structures. Um, as well as uh, heat and variance for fluidity and liquids and things like that. And so capturing that checkpoint of the data um, as the explosion goes from uh, zero uh, nanoseconds to seconds to minutes, um, there's a large amount of data that can get produced very quickly with some of these calculations. And the checkpointing of that data um, can go a little faster uh, if you have a lower latency, higher capacity uh, persistent memory. Yeah, actually, um, let me talk a little bit about that HPC checkpointing. So you gave a good example, but uh, you know, maybe a related example is some of these HPC computing jobs are run for days or even you know a week or two, and uh, in that time they're computing all the they're computing a lot of solutions in the memory of all the different servers. And if they were to lose power or make a mistake or find an error in the code, they would lose all the data that they had in that memory because that memory is not persistent. So what they sometimes do is in the middle of the job, they'll take a checkpoint and they'll copy all the data from DRAM to uh, either hard drives or flash, and then they have a copy and they can restart the compute job from that point or rerun a different scenario from that point, or if they, you know, if, in case they have a power failure or some other kind of crash in the computing system. So they don't have to run the whole, you know, run the two-week job for another two weeks. They can pick up where they left off. So creating that checkpoint with hard drives or even flash can take quite a while. So one option is use persistent memory as fast storage. They can take that checkpoint faster. Uh, the other option is if you use persistent memory for the compute, then it's always persistent. And if you had a, a power failure, you wouldn't lose your data and wouldn't have to start over uh, if you just set it up correctly because the data 
the, the compute job would still be saved where it was uh, in the persistent memory if you're treating it as memory. So sorry Correct. for that interruption. Uh, let me let go back to you, Alan. And uh, uh, no, that's a great continue. great example. All right, thanks, John. Um, and I think that's actually about it uh, for my part of it. Um, so I think that uh, you know that the key takeaway here is. Uh, memory and storage uh, will differ by access model. So if you're accessing a lot of small bits of data um, very quickly and you want them very fast, um, like you're loading uh, cache lines for an application, uh, that's really a memory and a persistent memory type of usage model. And when you really want that data to not go away um, or be there in a persistent state, uh, depending on power, uh, that's another aspect of persistent memory, as well as if you have a lot of uh, if you have really need for a large capacity, uh, there's a good one. Um, and storage, um, I think a lot of folks are familiar with here. Um, and I'll, I'll defer to my uh, partner, Alex, uh, on this one. But I think the storage is, uh, um, you know, scale is huge. Um, there's generally tons of storage and, and millions and millions of, you know, terabytes these days and even up into petabytes. Um, and it's a, a little, takes a little longer to get to and a little longer to write to, um, but you can do a lot of volume very quickly um, to get to, to that area. Um, persistent memory really is kind of a in between, um, you know, what DRAM is and cache lines are in a CPU, um, and what that big, you know, high capacity storage is. Um, it should be thought of as another tier, um, and then the the persistent memory uh, programming model, um, um, and I'll answer the question on the right, that if uh, persistent memory doesn't follow the SNEA persistent programming model, um, what is it? Um, we didn't write the persistent memory programming model to be the end-all, be-all. Um, there's many, many other ways to do a lot of these things. I think what we were trying to do as an industry association is really uh, provide a collection of thoughts uh, from a lot of different companies that are invested here um, and give some good examples of what the programming model should be like and what you want to think about when you're changing your your tiering from just DRAM and storage. Um, so it's not uh, complete or or completely, um, I don't know what the right term is, uh, super, it's comprehensive, but it's not covering everything. Um, there is support in Linux and Windows. Um, both operating systems have uh, support for uh, uh, not only persistent memory file operations, but for direct access. Um, and they're both called DAX, uh, which is nice. Um, and it can be used, again, um, with the proper operating system without application modifications. Uh, but to truly get the benefit of persistent memory, um, depending on you know how much you want to invest in an application, uh, you can take it all the way to the point where it'll do flushing and uh, fencing and, and moving data in and out of uh, CPU caches and DRAM uh, to make sure it is persistent. Alan, thank you. Uh, you know, we, we have some more questions. I believe we might have lost Alex. He wasn't feeling great. I've recommended in an offline message to him that he should go see if he has any of that gin or scotch, maybe a dram, maybe more than a dram, <laughs> and that might make him, that might help. Uh, so uh, you've, I know you've answered some of the questions. Perhaps you could help me take on some of these other questions. So uh, one is, do we have any security challenges with persistent memory? I think we have um, plenty of challenges in security um, as it stands, including persistent memory. Um, and there's two ways to think about that. One of them is from a you know, we think about it from a memory aspect, whereas what are the <clears throat> the things you can do with DRAM that make it not secure? Um, does it need to be encrypted? Does it, you know, all of those things. It obviously doesn't need to be encrypted at rest because when you um, remove power, uh, the data is supposed to go the way. Um, although everybody's, I think, read the article about a group of German high school students in a can of air clean that uh, were able to pull data off of a non-powered DIM. Um, Persistent memory, uh, we try to think about uh, probably more like a, a, a storage device uh, where there is data there. It's just in byte addressable instead of block addressable. So from a, an SSD or a, a even a, you know, a spinning hard drive aspect, 
you want to have that data encrypted at rest. Um, depending on how paranoid you are, you want it encrypted during transmission, uh, things like that. So you kind of have to take it from both sides. But yes, there's uh, the same the same security challenges that you have with uh, SSDs uh, generally apply to persistent memory. Right, so that would make sense. So I would say whether or not you want to encrypt the data on the wire should probably be the same whether or not you're doing persistent memory or not regular memory or regular storage, but exactly. uh, data at rest, it sounds like, as you recommended, uh, if, you, if you felt like you needed to encrypt it on the storage or SSDs or hard drives, you probably want to encrypt it on the persistent memory uh, because as power goes off, it'll still be there in, in case you know, you're recycling that server or you're worried someone might steal the server or something like that. Um, okay, let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, so I'm not familiar with uh, WAF, W-A-F, but it says, how uh, does pers persistent memory have any WAF issues similar to SSDs? I don't know if that's related to write uh, to garbage collection or write allocation or uh, you know having to co coalesce writes for efficiency or write amp oh, it probably means write amplification is my guess, but maybe you can answer that. Um, because because of the nature of gets and puts uh, or load store, um, it's a little less of a problem. Um, although I don't know that we've actually characterized it in the same manner that you would an SSD. Uh, with an SSD, you're doing large 4K transactions that you have to, um, you know, kind of once a 4K block hits a controller in an SSD, it has to be split up and divided across the many die of NAND uh, flash memory that are inside of the SSD. Um, or nor flash memory. There's a couple different types. Sorry. Um, so your write application starts to back up depending on what your controller can handle. Um, uh, persistent memory, in general, has some of the same things, but the block, the write accesses are much smaller. So it'll happen uh, in a different different aspect where um, if you're trying to write too much to it, you're going to back up the queue inside of your microprocessor. Um, so it's different, called different, but yeah, sort of the same problem. All right, yeah, great answer. I was just thinking, I guess if you use, if your persistent memory happens to be an NVDIMM, which is DRAM backed up by supercaps and flash, then I would guess that write application wouldn't be an issue because it's really DRAM until the point of power failure. But then if you have some other kind of persistent memory, as you said, uh, like a 3D cross point or some kind of spin torque or MRAM or some other kind of the, some of those are perhaps less common, but things that people are working on, uh, then, you know, you could, you might have to look at some issues, depending how it's written to, uh, of write amplification. And I'm going to hope that that's what the, the audience members No, nope, that's can. exactly so, so, very well said. Yeah. Okay. Wow. We've got the more questions are starting to roll in here. Um, and uh, see, so what is the performance difference between a fast SSD as Persistent memory versus persistent memory as DAX, and I don't remember. I don't think you answered. You answered a similar question. I don't think you answered that one, or did you? I don't think I answered that one. Um, a fast SSD as DAX or persistent memory? No, I think it's persistent um, memory as DAX versus a fast SSD. Or persistent well, memory as DAX versus always fast. storage. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the the main difference would be when I have to. Um, in my kernel, once I've memory mapped or or a DAX space in memory to my application, um, I'm still using load store semantics or memory semantics to write to it. Um, it just looks like a file to my application. So I'm removing some of the storage stack latency. Uh, so you'll see a, a noticeable difference in latency. Um, but as far as uh, the type of transaction in, in and maybe the way to think about it is the apples reference, right? When I'm, even if I've mapped a, a persistent memory space as a file, my application sees it, writes to that file, but it still uses that file is a memory controller based thing, and it uses load store semantics or memory semantics. Um, when I'm writing uh, to a storage space, I have to invoke like in Linux POSIX um, or in Microsoft. Uh, an example is the storage stack there. Um, which has to package up four kilobytes of stuff and ship it off. Uh, so depending on the type of access, it can be much, much faster and much higher latency. Um, the vice versa also applies if I'm doing huge 
accesses where I've got multiple 64K packets, you can even make some persistent memory accesses slow. Uh, so it really depends on the type of um, access that you're doing. But your latency should always be better from a direct attached persistent memory uh, than it would be for a, 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 a larger 4K or 4 kilobytes uh, access uh, over a, a storage device. Got it. So the access model could be faster. And then, of course, we see that while well, persistent memory types vary, generally what we call persistent memory today also has faster media than uh, what's, what is in most SSDs. Correct. Well, yeah. Though, though of course, we also have SSDs that have, for example, the Octane technology. So I guess the line gets a little blurred. But let me go ahead and mark that question as answered. Um, one question is, does DAX work as SSD? I assume they mean, does DAX work as an SSD, direct access? Direct access does not quite work as an SSD, except it, it fools the application into thinking that is the easiest way to think about it. Uh, but behind Got the it. scenes, DAX is a, is a memory access. Excellent. Okay. So good point. So I, I think you covered that earlier. The DAX is a memory access that the application thinks is a storage access, uh, whereas an SSD, tell, and tell me if I'm saying this correctly, an SSD is application thinks it's storage, and it actually is a storage access going to the storage application. That's right, correct. So you're you're doing the packaging of a bunch of smaller cache line accesses into a four kilobyte block and shipping it off. Okay. Which happens pretty fast in today's microprocessors, by the way. So. Ah, okay. That's good to know. All right, another question: Does persistent memory have a lifespan similar to SSDs? For example, uh, three years with heavy writes, or five years with light writes. Is that an, is lifetime uh, or endurance a, uh, an issue with persistent memory? Um, for for flashback DRAM, it's uh, pretty similar to what your DRAM life is, which is almost infinite. Um, I know for uh, 3D Crosspoint or Optane, um, it's very similar to what an Optane SSD would be. Um, and I don't have details on um, any you know Memristor or Spin Torque or anything like that quite yet. Um, but for and the way to think about this is anything that's um, got a physical storage property where when you apply voltage, um, something actually changes or a bit flips um, rather than just being electric field will have a, a lifespan, uh, if that makes sense. Kind of just basic physics, right? Got it, yes. Um, well, some of us may not remember all our physics. But uh, another question. I had to relearn it myself, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one question. I'm not the expert. <laughs> yeah. So this is a question from earlier that we didn't get to, but uh, one of the older questions. But if, and talking about what we have in slide 15, if persistent memory is fast and, it can appear as, and can appear as byte addressable memory to applications, why bother with making PM uh, appear and be addressed like block, as block, you know, through block mode like a disk? So, you're you're speaking uh, the programming twigs um, mantra right now, um, but realistically, I think there's going to be, you know, if you look at the the span of applications that are out there um, and what's available, there's, you know, even even where I work, there's a lot of applications that have been written by somebody in the 70s and 80s, and they've left the company. The application will never get recompiled. Uh, so you want to put it in a virtual machine or leave it on a, a you know, a bare metal box. Um, uh, but if you can put it in a virtual machine and over-provision the memory for some of those applications, you can save a little money uh, by doing that. Um, so there's a, a class of applications that will never get modified. Um, there's a class of applications, I think, in the far right, uh, you know, if we're going from left to right and the far right, um, where people want performance no matter what, so they will invest in that application and modify it. Uh, and changing the code. Um, so they will do direct memory accesses from the application. Um, and there's kind of that middle ground where um, they just need a, a different tier of storage or a different tier of direct access to the memory um, without doing complete app modifications. And that's the, the reason for all of those different ways to think about it. It's really confusing, um, you know, if you, you're looking at it for the first time while you why would you want to make memory look like a SSD or an SSD look like memory? Um, but there's a lot of use cases and a lot of good reasons why in the middle. 
Understood. Okay. By the way, we're, we, I'm glad to see so many great questions. We're going to get to a few more. We won't get to have time to get to them all, but we will answer uh, any questions we don't get to in a written FAQ that we publish on our website. So I think I can squeeze in uh, just a few more. Do you need to do any uh, modification to the OS or application to support DAX? Um, most of the or most of the operating systems have been modified. Um, and once you have a modified application and it boots up and looks at the HMAT table and BIOS and sees that there's persistent memory there, um, it can offer the application uh, DAX mode. Um, and then the application just has to either, it can either use DAX mode if the application has been modified slightly to do that, or if it wants to use the persistent memory of storage, it can map it as storage as well and it sees it as a file there. Um, All right, so, the so it's a little a little hard to explain without showing you the, the bigger diagram, but uh, in the programming model, there's some really good references to what these are and why. Okay, so the OS does have to be modified, but the major OS's Windows and Linux are have already been modified to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the application does not need to be modified if it uses it like storage. It does need to be modified if it wants to use it uh, as DAX. As, as DAX, great. Yep. All right. Um, I would say, why don't you pick one of the, a couple of the, maybe two more of the remaining questions. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, sorry, I sprang that out you un unexpectedly. Yeah, no, actually the, a really good one here is, here. The persistent memory can provide faster access in comparison to NAND flash, but the cost is more for persistent memory. Um, what do I think the usability for this technology in the future is? Um, is you, you that's a, probably the the question that I answer every day at my own company. Um, but really, uh, if you look at uh, DRAM and DRAM speeds and DRAM capacity as they start to uh, get much much uh, higher frequency. And higher bandwidth um, with capacity is not growing quite as much, um, and NAND flash capacities um, growing density-wise almost exponentially over the next few years. Um, it kind of makes sense, or a little more sense, to have a tier uh, somewhere thereabouts in the middle. Um, and that's really the you know if you go back to when we first had hard disks spinning hard disks in. Uh, DRAM in the, the early 90s, um, your access times to uh, that that spinning media were so slow that getting a couple hundred RPMs more would, you know, make it faster. Um, I think with the growth and capacity and the amount of calculation that you need to do just in your storage, um, that's going to become more difficult. So having a, a tier in the middle uh, should help with that performance. Great, and then uh, we have time for one more, if you want to pick one more of those questions. Yeah, let me scroll in here. Uh, do the tools exist to secure data overwrite for security purposes? Yes, and you can always do that with software. Um, we're, we're trying to address at my company some of these um, things where we want persistent memory to have enough security that you, you know, the same level of security that you would have for um, storage as well. Um, and remember that there are tools available and there are things that you can do in software uh, that can overwrite all of the bits on something like this, just like you would do it on a hard drive. Excellent. I'm sure that's good to know if people are worried about, especially if people work in government or if they work in the financial industry or healthcare and they're worried about privacy or making sure they can erase certain data. And you have the competing requirements. In some cases, you have to keep the data for a certain number of years. In other cases, you have to make sure it's unreadable after you're done with it. Uh, so, Alan, excellent. Thank you very much. Also, thanks to Alex, even if he might not be on the call, but I know he'll listen to this part later. Let me go ahead and wrap up and uh, point out that this, as I mentioned earlier, this is the 10th in the SNEA NSF Too Proud to Ask webcast series. The previous nine webinars in this series are available on the SNEA website at this URL. Go to snea.org slash forum slash, uh, it, it was ESF, it might be NSF now, I'll double check on that, but uh, you can just look for the Too Proud to Ask webinars and you can see the previous uh, nine webinars in the series plus all the other webinars.
I'd like to also point out that we have another web webinar coming up on June 18th that's going to be an introduction to in-cast, head-of-line blocking, and congestion management. We'll talk about how different types of networks, uh, or especially storage networks, take care of these issues, tra basically traffic management for storage networking and optimizing traffic flow. That will be June 18th, same Bright Talk place, same Bright Talk channel. Uh, we do encourage all of you to give your feedback to this webcast. Please provide a rating and comments if you feel up to commenting. We'd love to hear your feedback, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, or how many stars are you going to give this webcast, uh, as well as your comments are always welcome for feedback. The, for those who want to see the slides, a PDF with the slides will be posted uh, very shortly after this webcast is over. And then again, any questions we didn't get to, uh, and I thought it would be great to see all those questions coming in. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. We will post an FAQ with all the questions and answers uh, on our website, usually about a week after this webcast is done. You can find out more about our past and upcoming webcasts by following us uh, our, SNEA, our, our blog site or by following us on Twitter. Not only is there at SNEA, but we have our own Twitter handle, at SNEA NSF. Okay, so with that, thank you everyone who attended this webcast. Uh, thank you for all the great questions. Again, we would love it if you would give us feedback uh, uh, before you leave. Alan, thank you very much for your presentation. Alex, thank you as well. I think uh, great coverage of the material. And we look forward to seeing everyone on the next NIA NSF webcast. Cool. Thanks, John.